everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Casual Master Quest. This is going to be a side quest, a little bonus for anybody that's listening. We're going to have some uh, off time, so to speak, as I travel over to Canada. We're going to have some fun over there, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to record. So, this episode is going to be here just in case, and I'd like to think it's an important one, Nick. Nick, how are you doing, buddy? Hi. I'm, Hi. I'm doing okay. Um, I think when this episode finally does come out, I'll be done with school officially for the semester. Um, but right now, as we're recording this, um, I've got a final in a few days. I've got another project a few days after that. Then I've got another deadline the day after that. Then I've got another final. And then I'll finally be done. That is a lot of finals, Nick. That that sounds like, I guess, college life, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, it's all ramping up. And I mean, we are hitting the climax, right? I'm almost done. Oh, cool. So technically, right now, you're edging. As hard as I can. Okay. <laughs> edging for exams. <laughs> yeah. I bet there's an anime for that. Okay. Sure there is. So, uh, also, I forgot to say, my name's Tyler Budito, but you guys know that. You're cool enough to recognize the uh, the su- uh, the nice, suave voice. I hope so. Uh, just for a random thing, a couple episodes ago, uh, I was terrible with the mic. I'd like to apologize for that, even though a couple episodes should pass between now and then. I'll probably apologize again next time you hear me, like two weeks previously. Anyways, time travel. It's irrelevant. Nick, you have been working on an incredible project over the past... Ooh, man, how many months? Um, Honestly, honestly, it only took about two and a half weeks to c- come up with that completely. Um, it's just that that course had so many other games we had to design um that it just felt like it was never ending but that specific game obsessed with success took about took me and my team two and a half weeks okay wow so two and a half weeks you'd think ea would start come knocking it's like hey you want to turn over a game for me <laughs> we'd love money but you think um man uh, go ahead so i was just gonna say uh just as a background for the course that we did uh it's called foundations of game design and a few years ago it used to be a mixed tabletop game uh like development class and also a, an actual video game development class but they a lot of people they realized that a lot of the students when they made video games were spending so much time uh debugging and trying to make the code work nobody actually made a fun game so they're like all right screw it we're just going to scrap the whole video game elements and we'll just teach you the principles and foundations of how to make a good game regardless of whether it's a physical game or it's a digital game okay that that, that is fair how long have you been taking this class um so to start at the start of semester which was jan so jan till uh i think semester started jan 4th so jan 4th till officially april 11th okay so yeah four months wow yeah well Four months in 10 days? Something like that. And so starting March, uh, the first two months of the course were like kind of getting to know each other, playtesting a bunch of games. Our first uh, assignment was we got a game called Up the River, um, an old school style game where uh, you have a board, you have 10 tiles, the tiles keep uh, going back every turn. And if you are on the last tile and that gets swapped out, you, you die kind of thing. Um, and you so die. we had to. Oh. Yeah. Not in the game, you die in the game, not. IRL. Um, I just mean, want to make that clear. The mafia would love it if you. If you felt, <laughs> uh, Russian roulette's just getting so bored, and let's just do. What do you call that? Up, up the river. Up the river. I'm gonna say uh, the mafia would probably prefer it down the river, but you know, take what you can get. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm simplifying the game a little bit, but basically, we were given that game. They were like, "All right, you need to redesign it," and we had some specifications. We redes- redesigned that, and. Um, you know, it was uh, five of us in a group. Everybody else was in groups of four. There was one group of three and one group of five, which was us. Uh, obviously, teaching staff made sure that it was okay with both them and us that it remained like this because we started playtesting a bunch of games in the first two weeks, and then we just really liked the way we were um, interacting with each other, and we didn't want to split apart. Right. Um, and so starting about March, we had our first... Um, first set of actual projects where we were designing our own solo games and the first one was called was a people fun game uh tyler would you like to guess what what in the game design world in the game principle world what people fun would allude to 
I would say it's like Monopoly, except the only thing you do is you get the draw from the community chest, and it's always fun. Pretty uh, like pretty much. It's just really focused on people having fun. It's a little bit engaging. It's a little bit social, but it's no real like competitive elements to it. There's no strategic elements to it, right? Um, and so we designed a game for that called Dysfunctional Family. And honestly, Tyler, <laughs> this was our masterpiece. Um, so basically, you get a scenario card you get a bunch of scenario cards each scenario card has a certain amount of resources it needs to be completed and the more scenario cards you complete uh, the more points you get and each have different difficulties uh, which tie to different amounts of points per scenario um, and the scenarios were built around the story of a dysfunctional family so you'd have scenario cards like the the scandalous uncle and we'd have uh, little descriptions of events on the cards saying oh you know your uncle bob was found in a hotel room with uh with your gay gardener and two strippers what the hell stuff like we went we went all for it there was no there was no there was no PC here. There, there was no, there were no snowflakes here. There was no, there was no, no. limits. We weren't afraid of crossing here. It, it, it sounds like this would be Seattle's worst nightmare game at this point. <laughs> we had, we had uh, resource cards such as money, uh, poverty, um, and my favorite one: weeds, weeds, dude, weeds, sex, and alcohol, and. And so basically you go through, you take turns drawing cards, you draw resources, you draw actions that allow you to steal resources from other players. It allows you to give players other scenarios, so it takes them longer to complete their game. Um, and uh, th th the problem was when we designed that game, it wasn't a people fun game. It was, it was, a more, it was more fitting for the next project we got after that because uh, people fun is supposed to be a quick, easy to play game, right? Um, and our prof was like, you, this is, this is awesome. No, actually our TA, our TA was like, this is awesome, but you can't, it doesn't fit the criteria. So we decided, all right, we'll shelve it for now because we really like this idea. And so we introduced, uh, we made a game within a week because we'd already used a week to play test that and make a prototype. Um, so within a week, we made a game called sold where, uh, you sit in a group, right? You've got two decks okay. of cards. Uh, from one, one's a product deck and one's in a, an audience deck. So you'll draw from a product deck and you'll draw from the audience deck and you'll get a product that you have to pitch to a specific audience. And you have 45 seconds to come up with the pitch and present it. And so I think Cards Against Humanity, whoever has the best pitch, people vote and they win that round. Okay, so let me get this straight. The first game was a mafia friendly game, which I'm totally kidding, where you die not in real life. It gets switched over to the concept of a dysfunctional family that involves all sorts of wild and in certain areas of the world illegal illicit activities. And then it evolves into this. Okay, well, Up the River, that was a, that's a game that already exists. We were given that as our first assignment to redesign it. And so we did that and that's separate. And so when they ah. told us come up with a people fun game, we we designed we came up with this functional family. So the the foundation for this functional family was when we we did like a whole brainstorming session that was one of our labs, one of our workshops. Okay. And the idea that we decided to go with was you pick a uh, like you have three or four different phases, I can't remember now, but you pick a character. Uh it's I think we called it build a hero or something that was our working title you'll draw you'll draw a character that already has a passive ability and then you'll draw seven abilities from an ability deck and you get to keep four and then from there you go into the actual gameplay where you go through scenarios and events and stuff and we figured that there's too many decks there's too much um uh it's just too much to know for like a general kind of casual game and so that evolved into dysfunctional family where you have to draw resources to complete these events because a people fun game focuses a little bit more on the narrative uh elements um but then they're like no you can't you, you this it doesn't fit the criteria and also it would have been we got censored tyler because what? because because for, <laughs> for our final game uh, it'd be a bunch of high schoolers playtesting our game, so we couldn't. Uh, we oh couldn't. No. We couldn't go forward with this functional family, so we have it on the shelf. Um, we will never forget it if we ever decide to ever bring that back to life. And so, so yes, to just touch on the whole censored part. Did you get censored because that you felt like it might have been too insensitive for that kind of age group? Um, yeah, just more inappropriate um, because I think when they meant high schoolers. Um, 
high schoolers from um, like both limits of ages, right? So what what age does high school usually start in North America? North America, it's usually from 14 to 18. Yeah, so 14 to 18, talking about strippers, hookers, scandalous affairs. Um, I think not that they aren't exposed to it. I think as a fun pastime game might not have been appropriate. I would agree just for the sake of more conservative parents and uh, teachers, because I feel like they would lose their wig. You would probably bring about the next age of revolution that, you know, came along with uh, movies like Grease and Footloose kind of situations here. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, because they were going to be chaperones. They said they, they were going to have adult like teachers and stuff chaperoning and checking out the games as well. So I'm like, all right, let's not get ourselves unnecessarily in trouble. Right. Um, so we put dysfunctional family on the shelf. And then to satisfy the requirements of the People Fund project, we, we designed Sold, where you draw a product, you draw an audience, and you have 45, I think it was minute or 45 seconds, I can't remember. But you had a short amount of time to prepare a, a pitch and present it. And these are all products that we got from, like, if you Google infomercial products, these are these are kind of the products that we were working with. So you had like um, you had like an attachment, like a strap for your head that would hold a toilet paper roll for when you're sick. <laughs> right that's the kind of stuff that we had and then the kind of audience we had was oh gosh i can't remember like pitching to a group of mormons or um I, i'm on the spot now and i can't remember too much but that that was sold and it did well because it was just like a fun kind of casual game like you're drinking with your buds you know like all right let's pull it. because we took the idea from cards against humanity where we wanted a kind of like group competition kind of based um, game that was kind of casual and would get people to know each other a little bit better but we wanted right. to take it even more like laid back Death Saving Bros is an actual play Dungeons and Dragons podcast that'll make you feel like you're at the table with friends as our adventurers bumble their way around. I jump over the railing and tackle Figus. See Figus, they do remember you. Who? Uh, and who the fuck is that? I need your help. With what? The tips. I need the tips, <laughs> Frosted Figa. To be frosted. New episodes are released every Tuesday on your podcasting app of choice, so join us in the realm of Ralveria for an epic quest you won't forget. Everybody is to hear the magic that is going to be created right now. I mean, when it, when you think about it, Cards Against Humanity is like the ultimate dream goal at this point, wouldn't it? In terms of in terms of humor, it really depends on the kind of game that you're designing. Um, in terms of humor, I think Cards Against Humanity does so many things well. It it has a it has a narrative that you can bring to it based on the group of people that you play with. Um, it has a competitive element because the truly comedic people in any given group would like to be the funniest one. Right. Um, the, the main issue that I see generally with Cards Against Humanity is when they become cultural and you don't get it. Like a lot of the times I have the Canadian version of Cards Against Humanity and there's just some terms that I wouldn't know if I wasn't Canadian. Right. right? And uh, that's some of the issues that I see with games like that. And in my case, I'm not actually a big fan of Cards Against Humanity because the people I usually play with... Uh, don't appreciate my kind of humor and there's a lot of raunchy laughs that you can have in some of this stuff and so what i think is comedy gold gets passed up because ha, this first one talked about a, a baby and it's like okay yes that, that that's fair it, you got to play to your audience in that game but anyways so you were working on sold what happened next so then came our serious fun project now serious fun um is is a type of game that is meant to make the user or the audience reflect right on on meaningful actions that they make during the game and how that affects their own life sort of some a kind of like relatable game um what's the what's the one uh visual visual novel style game that i'm thinking of uh life is strange that's a very good example of a serious fun game because you're put in a uh to some extent universally relatable environment uh, the kinds of decisions that you have to go through on like a daily basis with high school. And then it starts getting a little wacky, but you still have that element of like, okay, you've got a young kid making all these decisions. What would you do? Right. Uh, should I, should I do use my powers here or should I use my powers here? Um, right. Another game would be papers, please, uh, where you have to actually do the job effectively of an immigration agent. But if you're anybody who has a little bit of a soul, you feel for everybody coming through all the time. Right. right. And the game will 
either reward you or punish you depending on how you handle certain situations i, I do re- remember a specific scene where the husband's like my wife is coming in soon can you make sure she gets through the wife comes in and she has a uh a flaw on her passport right. so you either got to reject her or let her in and i'm pretty sure if you decide to let it slide and let her in she uh she blows up the place it is it's not pretty right um, I, I think I, I like a game like Papers, Please does a really good job at touching on um, the humanity of people, the humanity, the kind of humanity you need to show to people. But also, I think it does a good job at showcasing some of the very, albeit exaggerated, very real dangers sometimes in our world. I, I think in just a very general sense, I don't want to target any specific kind of area. Certainly not. No, Nick, you, you yeah. are not known for ever doing anything like that. <laughs> So, um, so our series fun game, it was meant to, meant to make people think about their game, about the kinds of things that they're doing in the game, not just while they're playing the game as they're trying to win, but also like just the overall theme and narrative of the game. Um, before I get into that, our very first like mini assignment was to take a game and introduce one feature. I cannot for the love of my life remember what game we we played and we reintroduced a new feature but there was another team that introduced uh, a new feature to a game called Monopoly Deal. Have you ever played Monopoly Deal Tyler? I don't believe I have, no. It is the card based version of Monopoly and it is so goddamn fun but I can never win at that game. So basically you draw from a deck of cards, right? You draw okay. properties, you draw a bunch of other actions that you can do, and you draw money, right? So you'll place down a property, you have rent cards, where if you have a property of that color, you'll play that rent card, and then everybody has to pay you that amount of money. Um, you can, If they don't have any money in the bank, they have to pay you in whatever else that they own, so being other properties. So the goal of the yeah. game is to complete three full sets of properties. Because you'll have, like, uh, like similar to with the board game, you'll have uh, four of the train stations. So you want to collect all four of those, and that'll be one full set. Or you'll have right, three of the red sense. ones, or three of the yellow ones, or two of the dark blue ones, which have the highest rent, and so on. Um, and when we play tested the other group that introduced a new feature to that, we fell in love with that game. And so now, as a group, we start off each and every meeting with at least two rounds of Monopoly Deal. Uh, to this day, since the since since the very time we played that game together, we were like, "Holy shit, we love this game!" We looked online; it's eight dollars in Walmart. I'm gonna go get it. So we all no, have a copy of Monopoly enough. Deal now. <laughs> nice nice i know what i'll be playing soon then oh yeah when you when you come over and when you uh yeah at this point when we release this you probably wouldn't have met them yet but hopefully we get a chance to get everybody together and you'll be able to play test obsessed with success which is where monopoly deal played a huge amount of um influence um in the sense that we we enjoyed the way you could um mess with people and we got that also from uh, Exploding Kittens. Exploding Kittens allows you to sabotage other players as much as you want. That that That's a card game? Exploding Kittens? Oh, yeah. No. So Exploding Kittens is a card game. So um, you have four players. You each have cards in your hand. You have one defusal bomb. And you, you have attack cards, uh, defense cards, and a whole bunch of other action cards. But in the deck, there are Exploding Kittens. When you draw an Exploding Kitten, you die. Unless you have a defusal card. But you only get one defusal card right at the start. So when you draw an exploding kitten, let's say I still have my defusal card, I defuse that bomb, but that exploding kitten doesn't get discarded. It goes back into the deck. Ooh. Right. So there are, I, I believe there are, it's it's made for three to six players, and there are six exploding kittens, and there's always one more uh, exploding kitten than the number of players, I think. Uh, so if there's four players, there's five exploding kittens in the deck. And... It keeps going until you get to the very end of the deck and there's like seven cards left, but you know they're all exploding kittens because the exploding kittens go right back in the deck. <laughs> so when I, so when I pull an exploding kitten and I'm dead, I can choose to put it back wherever I want. I can choose to shuffle the entire deck if I wanted. I can f- choose to put it right on top. I can choose to put it right in the next three cards. So it allows you, it's this kind of like fun sabotage style of gameplay where if I draw an exploding kitten, but I have my defusal, I can choose to put it right on top to force my the person next to me um, to draw that and get rid of their defusal if they have one. Brutal. I like yeah. it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very fun game and Exploding Kittens Monopoly deal formed the very foundation of the kind of um, um, experience that we wanted our players to have. We wanted them to 
to be able to strategize, but also sabotage in a way that made it fun and made it feel fast. Uh, we didn't want it to be this long, like strategy type game because somebody in our class actually made civilization into a board game. And that bored oh, the heck no. out of me. Oh no. Right? Oh we, God. We didn't want that. Um, so basically- uh, How long is the card game? Like uh, six to nine hours? It honestly, I, I like don't, a lot of you people- You don't have to answer that legally. No. A lot of people complain about this, and I will never know why, because it's stated very clearly in the uh, project specifications. It said, design a game that's really not too much more than 15 minutes. When they designed their game, uh, the the Civilization board game, uh, a good playthrough is 45 minutes. And then they were complaining when the TA is like, you can't have it this long. They're like, it says it nowhere. And I'm like, mother motherfuckers, it says it right there in the project specs. It's not my fault that you can't read properly. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like, why why aren't you reading the project specs? Were you about to do the clap meme on Twitter? You I do must that. read I, the <laughs> project specs. I do that all the time. And so, actually, funny story about that team. So <laughs> I'm going to go off and... All right, so... Um, when we had our first like official presentations uh, for when we first designed Dysfunctional Family, uh, they're like, all right, your presentation shouldn't be more than like, I think they said seven minutes. Um, that week was unfortunately busy for all of us, uh, like me and my team. Uh, so we couldn't really practice our presentation. And so when we actually delivered it, it, was, it went up to 11 minutes, but nobody was really like timing. Even the TA and the prof, they weren't timing. But the team that designed the Civ board game, they were timing us. And so when it came to the question and answers and feedback uh, uh, period, uh, one of them raised their hands up and I called him to the to this day. From from that point to this day, I've called him Clock Boy because he's like, did you guys practice your presentation? I'm like, no, you know, it's been kind of a rough week, but this is what he's like. Did you know that it was 11 and a half minutes? You guys really should have practiced your presentation. From that moment on, Clock Boy was on my list and we put we went hard as fuck for this project, Tyler. Um, when they were playtesting Obsessed with Success, uh, they were all like, they were all unusually, they were all very upset. They were like looking at our cards and like, oh my gosh, you guys did so much work. So extra. I'm like, well, if you really think about it, I didn't say this to them. We were talking as a team after. If you really think about it, if you, were, if, you if that guy hadn't said anything about us being over, we wouldn't have bothered. That's how petty I am, Tyler. <laughs> That's a, I held a grudge for two and a half months. I was waiting and I was afraid for you that you're going to say they were play testing it and then they uh, they started dog earing the cards or something like that, bent the cards. And then uh, I was going to see you raise like a voodoo doll of this character <laughs> in question. Like, this guy has bad knees. I have no idea why. Is you put another pin into his kneecap or something like that? <laughs> no, it's hey, just no, like, kudos to Clockboy. Uh, uh, he, he lit a fire under us, like collectively as a team. It wasn't just me. Like from that moment on, all of our presentations were 10 seconds under the time limit. All of our slides were spot on. We had animations on our slides. Uh, we put so much effort into playtesting. Uh, we got our cards printed in the States, same as they did after hearing it from us. But we actually managed to get it on time and they didn't get it on time. So we just Damn. feel fucking fantastic all around. And everybody in the class liked our game the best. So... Tyler, this is one of my proudest achievements this year of 2019. You've been very ecstatic and proud, and honestly, you have everything to show for it. You did, uh, you and your team uh, help and create a video as uh, maybe as, uh, a showcase video, I guess you would say. Right. Um, and so I feel, I think we all feel a little bit weird about the video because they weren't very clear on what they wanted, uh, the teaching staff. Um, they're just like, we want you to pitch the game, but also we want you to tell us about the play testing sessions and the iterative process. And I'm like, and it's like, it, I want you to make a piece for your portfolio. And I'm like, wouldn't you want us to make um, more of a marketing pitch then? And so that's why you uh, you watch the video. It's 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 very off because we had to fit fit all these criteria. So when we actually do go forward with this, we're going to be reshooting that and remaking and make one that's actually market worthy. No, that's completely understandable. I was waiting for the, again, the uh, hypothetical pop in my head. They look at it like, we need you to pitch it. <laughs> <laughs> like, they don't, they don't explain it. Like, it, it needs more cowbell. I was, like, I, I know you're hitting as hard as you can. It needs, it needs more. more. Yeah. No, they gave us like a list of things that they wanted, but it just, it did make sense together. Um, 
I I have no good analogy for it. I'm not I'm not quick on my feet like that right now. But they're like, all right, we need you to show us iterative process, but we also need you to show us people having fun. But we also need you to show us the narration. But we also like the narrative. But we also need you to show us, um, you know, the design. Of the, I'm like it's it, it's just a very convoluted video that they had. But like overall, it worked out. I think so. Um, and Tyler, you're in the video. Uh, well. My my voice is in the video, yes. Your voice is in the video, and you helped us uh, a lot. Really. Uh, like, I, uh, honestly, I think it drew drew in the video together quite well. Thank you. If you if you had told me that he took like my uh, emote and kind of like slipped it in like a three by three pixel picture somewhere, <laughs> I was like, oh. but then I start words waldoing for it. But yes, I uh, I was both very proud and then very critical uh, of my uh, use of my voice in the video because well, I told you the reasons. Right, I was, it was the continuation off- of the the mic issues. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I was duct taping my mic together and praying to God that I would not clip anymore. And I'm hoping right now that Nick Nick would tell me if I was ever clipping. That's why he told me last episode, right, Nick? Nick, yes, of, of course, course of course, I would I would tell you if you were clipping. I guess it just didn't sound like sound like it to me at the, at the time, and that's the only issue, thing reason I didn't raise any. It's concerns. okay. We were both stressed. We didn't notice it, that. Nick, we have talked about the history of Obsessed with Success, but we still haven't even touched on it. What is the game? So Obsessed with Success is a, is a strategic card game. Um, the the narrative the narrative background to the game is uh, because we had to think of something that would have an impact that would make our audience. Um, what's the word that I'm looking for, uh, reflect on like real life situations. Um, we wanted to focus on teenage suicides and, you know, students in high school um, and how much academic pressure is put on them specifically in parts of Asia, because I'm, I'm sub I'm South Asian. So I'm technically Asian, uh, purely by technicality and the rest of my team, they were from uh, uh, China and Hong Kong. Um, and so this is a culture that we are uh, like our entire team um, uh, was familiar with, is familiar with. Um, and so going off that, we thought about, all right, parents are putting this much pressure because sure, they might want the best for their kids, but it's also very much a societal thing, right? right. It's like, oh, you know, my son goes to Harvard, you know, and and my, my daughter goes to Princeton or, you know, it's, it's, it, it's very much a... Uh, culture of sure we want the best for you we want you to be happy but we also want you to make as much money as you can kind of thing so that we can we we're in good social standing can you allow me to put myself in hot water sure yeah yeah. it's like a proud mom of a army or a armed forces veteran who puts a sticker that says my child is a army vet or something like that where uh by having her son uh you know make a great sacrifice and all that she feels entitled to you know ride the coattails of that success which is terrible i know but it's, no but you're absolutely right it's it's the same thing like, it's like, like i can understand um to a lot to some extent i can understand um like watching somebody that you've you've raised and you only want the best for them, but living your dreams through through them or worrying about what they're going to do and how that's going to affect you and your life. And so you want them to only be the best. You only want them to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. It, it's just an insane amount of pressure. And it's not fair because they're going to grow up to be their own people. If you as a child, if you as a child, I can understand feeling obligated to, you know, doing making your parents proud and, you know, helping them out when they get older. That's all fine and dandy but only living your life for them is not going to give you any long-term happiness which in the end is not going to get them any long-term happiness and just it's a lose-lose all around um it's rough man but more importantly you turned a game out of it right so amazing yeah so looking at uh, like so i started talking about parents and looking at parents are like well isn't this almost like a competition it's almost as if we could turn this into a board game a board and game so, of four neighbors who have their children <laughs> going to the same school. So the official name for the game is Obsessed with Success. Uh, the motto slash tagline is the ultimate parenting competition. And so you're, you as a player are a parent and you control a piece that represents your child. And so you, you're trying to equip your child with the best skills they have for them to be the most successful and confident uh, child by the end, student by the end of the game. Um, 
you uh, you set up you have a little board that tracks uh one of our resources called confidence um it goes from 10 to 0 uh 10 8 10 9 and 8 confidence it means you're overconfident and so that has some effects uh 7 6 5 4 is normal confidence it's like your standard all right everything's good we're we're doing okay you know you're a good student um, it's monday then- i'm not calling in sick Exactly. And then three, two, one is like you're, you're super insecure. You don't have any confidence and that has some benefits to it because I'd when you rather hit, call or call in sick and watch Dragon Ball Z all day, because <laughs> when you hit zero, you're eliminated from the game. Um, and so you start off with a bunch of cards. Everybody's dealt five cards. Uh, you draw two and the cards go from skills, actions, events, and encouragement. Encouragement replenishes confidence for when you lose some or when you're getting dangerously low. Um, actions allows you to actually I should probably start the other way encouragement is fine we covered that because confidence is 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 key uh, you have to keep it up and you want to be the uh, student with the most confidence then you have skills three categories of skills sports music and academics uh, the more skills you have the better you will be when it comes to the events so when an event card is played let's say somebody plays a sports event card uh, but I only have I have one sport uh, in my skill count, I have one, and Tyler has three. And if he plays a sports card, I will lose points. I will lose confidence according to the amount stated on the card. Right. And so it goes according to that. We have um, event cards that go for each category. So uh, sports, music, and academic uh, events. And we also have um, school championship events, which take into account everybody's skill points. Hmm. Um, then you so- have action cards that allow players to steal swap exchange skills force other players to lose skills and i'm sorry yes tyler i was gonna ask would that mean uh for the sake of the meta because i'm creating a meta in my head already you would want to typically either specialize in a skill that you know your opponents don't have to give you the edge or because but then you introduce the idea of a uh declathon or whatever you want to call it where uh you use all three skills to match together for a one big three moment there uh, how have players been like proceeding in order to win? Um, it, it again, it's a game that's based on luck to a large extent because of the car- kinds of cards you're dealt and the kinds of cards you draw. So it is absolutely imperative that after your first few playthroughs, you start being a little bit more flexible with your kind of strategy because you won't know what you're going to do until you have the cards in your hand. Mm. Um, okay. So, but but we've seen quite a lot of playstyles. We've seen players. Um, go on the defensive and just spam all the encouragement cards they have so they stay at 10 confidence so regardless of what happens to everybody else they're not going to play any skills they're probably not going to do any actions they'll just stay up there so by the time the deck runs out they'll probably be the winner um you have players who play very uh, a very glass cannon build where they'll they might not have the skills uh when they play an event card so so they're going to lose points but they're dragging other people down and then they have an encouragement card to bring them back up um so it, it 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 is a very it, we've seen people played in ways that we weren't even predicting, and, and that's, that's the best I, thing, isn't it? It's it's so much that, that was one of the best things ever. Seeing people do things and like, holy shit! Okay, I didn't, I you know, I could never have thought of people doing these things, and that's part of why we, with all the feedback we've gotten, because we've put maybe, um, in in two weeks, we've put maybe fourteen, sixteen hours in people play testing. External people. I'm not talking about just us because we play tested a bunch, uh, but just about 14, 16 hours. Every like outside people, people's families, other friend groups, just a whole bunch of people, like other people in our uh, workshops, uh, just to figure out, all right, uh, where the where the loopholes are, where the OP cards are, and we've adjusted things accordingly. Hmm. And now that you've done plenty of play testing and all that stuff, you did say that you had a official play test copy printed out. Yes. So there is a company called Print and Play in Vancouver, Washington. Um, Vancou- because Wait, the, what? Vancouver, Washington? There is a Vancouver, uh, Washington. It's right by Eugene, Oregon. Okay. It- is that a sister city at this point? Or do they? Uh, just honestly, wanna- I've, I have no idea. Enjoy the glory? Okay, sure. Anyways, Vancouver, Washington. Uh, yeah, Print they're based there. Yeah, um, we sent them. They have like templates where you put in like your cards and your board, like your the board cover design, everything. We sent it to them, uh, and because of the time constraint, like we did send it in not last minute, but we really didn't have a lot of time to work with. They're like, all right, if you want it on this day, 
it's 120 if we ship to the states 160 sorry no 180 if we ship to uh uh vancouver if we ship to canada and i'm like why don't you just ship it to my cousin in seattle I'll drive down and I'll get it. It's a lot like I only spend about 30 in gas to fill up my tank, 35 maybe. Um, and it'll be maybe a six hour trip. If I stop and take my time, it's not going to be a big deal because I'd rather save that. This is us by the way, not Canadian. Okay. So, uh, uh, like I was doing the whole meme with, you know, equations <laughs> up in the background. Uh, no, no, this was, this is, in, this is all in, this is all in us. Um, and so, uh, we did that. One of my team members, Crystal, she she accompanied me uh, just because it was early in the morning and I, I was going to fall asleep um, if if I didn't have somebody with me. Um, so we picked it up, came back. Yes, Tyler. I would like to say, first off, shame on Vancouver, Washington's uh, businesses for not offering some kind of sweet deal for shipping to its own city that may exist in Canada. Uh, the second thing is, this is amazing information for somebody who wants to build a card game in Canada. You know, and I, I'm sure there's options in Canada, but for something this convenient and accessible, you would have to, you know, make the extra jump just to, you know, get an American based product. You're talking almost $80 worth of uh, additional cost just for shipping. Well, and this was a rush import. order also. So I sure. don't know. I don't know what it could have been if we if we were like three weeks out and we're like, yeah, dude, we have three weeks of time. Just ship it whenever it's ready. Um, so I I could I'm it's I'm not in a situation to give anybody a fair idea of what the cost would have been like then. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Fair I'm, enough. I'm sure there were other local options, but these guys seem to be the the most viable option for such a such a uh, time constrained rush order. And so we're like, all right, let's do it. And I have to say. Parts of our product look okay. The 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 actual case for the game, the cover and the case, they look fantastic. Uh, the rule sheet that we designed looks fantastic. The cards, however, do not. So when they sent us a template, on the template there was a there was three rings, three uh, like lines uh, for the rectangle for each card. One was a bleed line, one was a cut line, and one was where everything should go. Right. So okay. in in the order from inside to outside, cut line. Um, um, uh, no info, like the content line, uh, cut line and then bleed. Right. And so we assumed, which is what they said is you just stick it in the template, align everything, and then we'll cut according to that. They didn't. So a lot of our cards have like forged. Thank God we had the bleed. Otherwise everything would look bad. But a lot of our cards have like too much cut off on one side, too little cut off on the other side, but they're all uniform at least. So at least they fit in a deck. Hmm. Needless to say. Good. We probably will never use them again. Ooh, okay. That's that's information that, that no. I was actually like, hmm, I always wanted to make a, my own card game. Maybe I'll we'll go to the no. Okay, fine. Um, Vancouver, game, Washington. You've been game born. crafter. Um, is another website that's based in Wisconsin. Uh, another company, uh, game crafter. Um, and apparently they do quite quite uh, good work too. Um, and they're not as expensive. I bet they're operated in Bay City, Wisconsin. I think it's, it, you know, from Bay City, Wisconsin to Bay City, Michigan, it feels like it would be a perfect match for me. Maybe they won't give me a discount. Maybe they won't, but like all I heard was that it was Wisconsin. And I'm like, all right, cool. That's a place in the States that I've heard of before, but definitely don't know where it is. So, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable, but also upsetting because I could not tell you where the fuck any of the. I was about to call them territories, uh, <laughs> provinces of Canada lie. Right. Uh, I know British Columbia. Yeah, it's it's all the way out there. Okay. Uh, next one. I have no idea. You sketch one. Uh, I know Toronto, which obviously is you know cl closer to me. That would make sense. Right. Right. Uh, Toronto are, is in Ontario. Which New is... Brunswick. Sure. That sounds like a city. Okay, I'm about to tear myself apart here uh, with Canadian. Gonna... We know geography. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the Tyler Canadian Initiative. Teach me about Canada. Okay, so how many cards are in this uh, game? Uh, 113. 113. That offers a shit ton of variety. Yeah, 113. Um. Oh, oh no, sorry. 113 total cards. Uh, in terms of action cards, I think we have uh 14 or 15 different kinds and so there's a lot that you can do you uh, we've got 
double damage event cards. We've got event cards that make, uh, sorry, action cards, action cards that make everybody lose uh, discard f- one skill forcibly. Uh, you've got, um, I think it's called, oh my god, no, which is if somebody does like a particularly devastating action, you can play that card as as defense, and then it negates the action. Um, we've got some <laughs> defense. Oh my god, no. Yeah, we've got some. We wanted we wanted to be a little bit, you know, a little bit. We wanted to be hip, you know, a little bit young. And- <laughs> oh boy, here, Nick, probably the hippest person I know at this point, besides maybe one or two other people. Like uh, the other people are like full on beanie, you know, kick hack a stack hip. Right. Uh, tell you know, we're trying to be hip, reach the mainstream well, okay. audience. Uh, no, man. no, no, I'll tell you, no, no, I'll tell you why I say that because I am turning twenty four. Uh, the person who's next oldest um, is twenty two, and it ah, just goes. So you are the senior executive of this project. I'm the senior, yeah, and then it just goes younger from there. I think the youngest is twenty one. She just turned twenty one. Cool, cool, yeah. Uh, the help clarify, you did say in the project that the gains are supposed to last uh, around 15 minutes. Uh, how long you did the play testing? How long does it usually take for you to complete a game? Um, if my team is playing um, anywhere from five to 15 minutes, like depending it really on how depends. crazy shit. OK, it, yeah. no, you, um, you said random luck. So, I mean, RNG is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to keep that. It, it was a hard decision because so when our when we had our play testing showcase, um, and our TA and our prof came and they were play testing our game, um, my prof got eliminated in round two, which has never ever happened. That it was just a very unlucky series of unfortunate events. Like that never happens. That's the first time recorded that somebody's been eliminated in round two, and he was so salty about it that he got up and left he got up and left and then the three of us it was four of us playing three of us continued playing and then he came back after we'd finished and he's like all right i've got some feedback for you i'm like motherfucker you got salty and you left because you had the unfortunate luck of being eliminated but at least stay and watch watch what we're doing because you're grading us on this watch the actions we're playing the kinds of skills the kind of strategies were coming up because he's like i didn't really feel like the game was that you had no meaningful decisions i'm like but you weren't here and our ta stood up for us god bless him he really stood up for us he's like he's like when you left and i don't know why you left we actually like things really started getting interesting and it was it was really close like uh, my ta won the game and i'm like thank you because how can you it's like me <laughs> it's like me critiquing league of legends and dota 2 this entire time <laughs> without <laughs> without playing as much and be like i fucking hate this game you're like all right i got so much to tell you about league of legends here <laughs> nick i was and yeah here's my third hypothetical that popped in my head during this whole conversation i was waiting for you to say like one of them like uh of you know you and your team like dead-eyed him and said you know one out of five of the people that commit suicide do it in freshman year they give it up early and just like just hit him with that (laughs) that deep knowledge like that's why you lost on round two because it can happen it can happen (laughs) as soon as that you're laughing, I, I mean, that, that that makes sense because, like, when you're out of confidence, you're eliminated from the game. But that's very much uh, heavily implying that when your child loses confidence and their confidence goes too low, that's you know, end of the road. And yeah, it's it's it is it is a heavy game. It touches on heavy topics. Some of the teams did fantastic uh, work with their like narrative elements. We had a team that did a game based on uh, slavery. Um, I can't re- remember the exact. Um, uh, mom- the exact part of history or the kind of the event that they were portraying, uh, but basically a, a bunch of people uh, were able to escape their, you know, quote unquote masters. Um, and w- it, it was a game that you play, I think, for five days on the road and you try to survive. Um, Bowsers, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that that hit a lot closer than home than uh, what we were expecting. No offense, Canada is the place where we all tried to get to. Well, I shouldn't say we all, but uh no, so yeah, you know. I think that was that was it. Like it was I can't remember what event specifically it was, but it was a group of people who managed to escape and they were trying to make their way north into Canada. Uh then there was another group that did In five days, on- that's impressive. Wow. Are they androids? Is this Detroit become human? <laughs> uh I'm sorry, that was an allegory. My bad. No. Nah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no allegories. We don't do no, that. No, no allegories. Wow, that's um, a three shout back right there. <laughs> there was another team. They were called Schooled, and they were kind of like our counterparts in the sense that they, they, their game was focused on university life. So you start off the game with a certain amount of grade points and a certain amount of money, and you have to survive 10 weeks of a semester to get to the end with the highest grade points without being in debt. Because when you run out of money, you can get a loan from the bank. Ooh. Yeah, and I know how that goes. Uh, I know a lot of people know how that goes. <laughs> and so it was touching on that kind of like struggle that a lot of people go through with how ex- how basically universities become like post secondary in- educations become an in- in- in industry instead of like a thing that people can pursue. Right, Nick. It's it sounds like you have a great game that's happening right now. It's currently obviously in the uh, the beta phase. Have you and the team uh, considered the possibility of introducing this to people who might want to give this a shot? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, So it's going to take a while. And we honestly have to do a lot of research because we are relatively young. Uh, we're, We're a group of five people. We all have different priorities, but we work really well as a team. And so it's imperative now that because we've all shown interest in moving this forward, that we take time and figure out... um. You know, figure out a business plan, figure out deadlines, figure out goals, find suppliers, find di- manufacturers, find distributors, um, and put together a proper document before we even think about anything. Because I looked into a Kickstarter, and a Kickstarter needs all of those, and it also needs bank details. So we have to figure out, all right, who's going to hold the money? Um, is it going to be a joint account? Are we all going to have access to it? Because who's going to keep track of it? Um, how are your goals in the next two years going to align with this? Because that's, I think, the safest or most minimum amount of time we have to look into if we're going to commit to this. In two years, where are you going to be? Are you still going to be interested? Because without any kind of um, like without any kind of fault or without any blame, when school picks up, e- either one of us can can disassociate from this project a little bit because we have to. We have our priorities, so it's right. going to take some time. But we really, really want to work on this because we honestly, truly believe we made a really good game. Uh, we think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and it's just exciting. It's just, I want to do this. I, and I haven't been excited for something like this in a long time. No, the, the last time I heard this much passion was about 45 minutes ago when you were trying to take on the Lionel. And uh, <laughs> this is a different time. Listen, this- Lionels, Lionels can eat a dick for all I care. And we will happily discuss that in the podcast, uh, yeah. you like the realsies. But uh, is there any last things, uh, you know, people that might be interested in something like this? How can they figure out more information? Um, read, uh, honestly, because so we had, I think one of the best things out of this class was we had a textbook assigned to us that was about the foundations of like game design. So I'm not saying that you need to get this textbook specifically, but I'm sure if you were to google game design or principles of game design all the different theories would pop up and read learn about them and start making prototypes with pen and paper with cards so all we did like our early prototypes were we took a deck of playing cards we on sticky notes we write wrote down skills school uh, academics plus one stuck it on the sticky card on the on the playing card and then we use that right nick uh, you must have misread or maybe i said it wrong I'm saying if they want to know more about obsessed with success, oh yeah, how I can they like, keep up? I was, I was trying to be wise and you were and trying to be super advice. academic. If Nick, if you're you know trying to follow <laughs> your dreams and your passions, why would I ask? How can <laughs> you become a competitor to this person so they can outdo you? I don't mind, dude. Competition is healthy. Competition forces people to change, and the only constant in this world is change. Right, because if you talk for more than seven minutes in a presentation, it's game over. You know, no competition keeps it fierce. I'll let, oh I'll yeah, let take uh, for clock honestly, boy I'm, just uh, give you not, shit. It was clock boy, and we called him clock team too. Honestly, if he didn't, we were thinking, but we went to dinner after our showcase, and we were sitting there. We, we all had some beers, we all had some sushi, and we're like, you know, if they didn't call us out, we wouldn't have done all of this. Right, because the amount of the amount of sleepless like our editor did that video in one day, Tyler. He only yeah, had it's amazing too. Because we had to go and get uh the game before we could put some of those shots of the game in the video, right? So like for example, our showcase was on a Thursday. Uh we went and got the game on a Monday. And he could only work on it on the Wednesday because of no, we got it on Tuesday, and he could only work on it the Wednesday because of school, uh his other projects. So he did that in one day. 
Um, our graphic designers fucking knocked it out of the park. Um, I will say as well, it made it a lot easier because Dysfunctional Family provided a good base for us to make this game. And so when during the week that everybody was still pitching, we'd already play tested. So we had a bit of a leg up. And so we had time to do all these other things and absolutely make it the best game that we possibly could. Good deal. And to answer the question that uh, he won't answer himself, you can find out updates from him, I guess, through LR Warrior 11 on Twitter. L are the letter warrior 11 uh people who listen to the show you know they know this and i hope that until you guys can get like an independent uh group communication format like some kind of social media here uh we will hope you hopefully be able to provide more updates as the game progresses yeah um we'll, we'll Please, see so, because i i want to play this game dude i mean you will be playing the game tyler but yeah um if you were to google us uh, sorry youtube um, and I'm sure Tyler will put a link to the video, but if you're on YouTube, will. obsessed with success, Tim Fung, F U N G, you'll be able to see our video. Um, and follow, like, honestly, just follow my social media or keep an eye on that LR warrior on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Twitch. And that's where we'll be talking about our Kickstarter or whatever, whatever we do in the next few months because it's going to take a while and we want to make sure that we do it right absolutely and uh i think that's going to be it nick uh much like your presentation i think we went over the seven minute mark so uh let's wrap this up uh, the only difference here is that you we enjoy our rants tyler i uh, well, yeah I do. I love that. <laughs> is there any last things you want to say before we uh call it good um no i'm honestly the only one last thing i did want to say was i i've never showed any interest in being part of like a video game development team but honestly this might have changed my mind in the sense that i wouldn't mind being part of a in a communication role where we're figuring out mechanics and how to make it fun rather than a, a strictly uh, a coding role i I don't know how, but me getting involved in video games has happened and I wasn't planning for it to happen. And I'm excited to ride that wave. Yeah, absolutely. And I do love when I get to see you have a little extra energy. I mean, don't get me wrong. You're always bright eyed and bushy tailed, but but I'm usually with- a little bit more mellow. I know. Well, usually the only time I see you excited and breathing heavy is when you're getting ready to headshot somebody in Crucible. So seeing this is nice. It's nice. It's salt-free passion right here. All right, let's call it for that. Thank you guys for listening. That was Obsessed with Success. We're hoping to give you, you know, more updates in the future. That was Nick. Him and his team are working on it. This is Tyler, the dumb guy who was asking questions. That was Clockboy, who told me that this was way too long of a show, but who cares? You know, give me the passion to do that anyways. And that was another side quest of Casual Master Quest. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. The intro to the podcast, titled Casual Master Quest, was paid for and produced by the wonderful talent Revelries Music. You can find more of their work at soundcloud.com forward slash Revelries Music, or just click on the link in the show descriptions. The background music is the album Top 50 Best Classical Piano Music by Brilliant Classics. You can find out more about Creative Commons at www.creativecommons.org forward slash license forward slash buy forward slash 4.0.